Let me go to Ari Melber, who is here uh, with some of the legal ramifications of this. Obviously, this is the first time we're seeing in real time how this unfolded. We don't see everything. We don't see what we would see from the dash cam video. We don't see what we would see uh, for if, if there was a body cam video. We know the family has seen that. We have their interpretation, which differs in many ways from what the official interpretation of it is. But when you look at this, what strikes you? This is just extraordinary video, hard to watch, first of all, at a human scale. The voice you hear as we've been playing it is the voice of the wife. So even before we get to what is legally relevant, you have the human side. She is literally filming the shooting and uh, what we know to be the killing of her husband. Hard to watch, as you and I just did in the newsroom, preparing uh, for this story first broken by NBC News' Gabe Gutierrez. Two big legal points I would flag. First of all, the length of the encounter. The first 50 seconds of this video shows the lead up to what we now know to be that killing. And I count 12 times that officers said, drop the gun multiple officers. So legally, that suggests that you had more than one officer who believed contemporaneously at the time that this individual was holding a gun and that they made numerous attempts to get him to drop it. We don't know that it was a gun, but they Correct. clearly seem to believe it. Let's state that again. Multiple officers who are saying their belief over those 50 seconds that this individual was holding a gun. So that goes to their state of mind. It doesn't go to the ultimate facts of the case. On the other side of the ledger, what we're hearing is something that police, in their descriptions of this incident, have spoken less about. What we know now, that we did not know 15 minutes ago, is that his wife was trying to explicitly warn them, while in the encounter, that he had a brain injury and that she believed he was unarmed. Now, her view doesn't automatically trump theirs, but it adds to the quantum of evidence about what the officers knew. We don't know if they heard her. There didn't seem to be at least about the TBI, traumatic brain injury, a direct response. It's no, they don't, they don't engage her verbally at all in this, although at one point after the shooting, they do seem to be telling her to stay, stay away, away and keep a distance. We heard her response to that. We can also mention the brain injury is something uh, that the family lawyers have referred to, that a year ago he did sustain that. So that is something that we have heard before. What we didn't know, as I say, corroborated that it was presented to the officers here in what is a high-stress situation. Now, something else that's going to get a lot of attention. We can show here, as part of the video, once Mr. Scott is on the ground uh, and four officers are surrounding him, the area of cement there that you see there on the ground around his body, and we've blurred the body for, for our reasons of standards, but the area on the bottom of your screen there, it appears in this video to be free of any objects. Correct. As, as you know, Chris, and as many viewers may remember, as people in, in this community have been calling for release of the video and saying they want more, what they have had is a still that allegedly showed an object that some believe to be a gun at his feet. That's the comparison there. This is legally significant whether or not this scene, this potential incident or crime scene, changed over time. What is that object and why on the new video that NBC News has obtained is there nothing at his feet? These it doesn't photographs answer. Are, this is a still photographs that we have seen previous to this. And this new video, again, the still you're looking at on your screen right now, as obtained by NBC's Gabe Gutierrez from the family, is at the moments right after the shooting. And that area, you can decide with your own eyes in the comparison here, that area on the right from this video obtained by NBC News does not appear to show an object. That raises questions. It doesn't give us answers. We don't know if... What questions a, does it raise? Uh, it raises the question of whether or not at that time from every angle was there nothing by his feet. So if we got the other video, dash cam, or personnel body camera video, we would have more than one angle to say, is there anything from that contemporaneous video evidence that shows an object or allegedly potentially a gun at his feet? If not, and that object came later, how did it come later? And did it come through natural or organic means? For example, a, a medic moving a body that dislocated then a weapon in a holster or, or in a waistband? Or did it come through some other means? I want to be clear here, legally and journalistically, we are not answering those questions today. But this video does add to the evidence that raises them. And the police, meanwhile, are holding other videos that might answer those questions. And I want to ask you about the legal implications of that. But I'm told that Gabe Gutierrez, uh, who got that video for us and who has been on the ground, has some new information for us. Gabe, what do you have? 
Uh, hi there, Chris. Yes, uh, speaking about the traumatic brain injury, yes, his, uh, his attorneys say, as they had previously said, that he had that traumatic brain injury. We're learning a little bit more about that. Uh, his family says that it was a motorcycle accident back in October of 2015, last year, and he was taking medication for it. His attorneys say that uh, during this uh, encounter, uh, since he was taking medication, they worry that, you know, perhaps he may have been confused. Perhaps he was on this medication. He was getting a lot of commands from several different directions. As for his relationship with his wife, Rakia Scott, they had been together 25 years, his attorneys say, and they've been married for 20 years. They have seven children, ages 9 to 20 years old. Again, an incredible scene uh, for her to witness as she was going to her apart to uh, the apartment, getting a cell phone charger. That's why she had left the truck, had been gone for three minutes, and again returned and came upon this scene. Uh, you know, let's back up here. Uh, Charlotte police have said that they were trying to serve a warrant on an entirely different man. So it does raise questions. How did they uh, zero in on Keith Scott or, you know, come across Keith Scott? We do not know that from the video. And as Ari mentioned, there are still many unanswered questions. This does raise so many questions uh, that, you know, demonstrators here in Charlotte have been asking if they can release the body cam footage and the dash cam footage. Perhaps that can provide more context. His attorneys say again that the clearest view that they have seen, and again, they saw it yesterday. The clearest view they have seen is actually the dash cam video, which has not been publicly released. Today, the police chief during a news conference saying it wasn't up to him, that it was up now to the State Bureau of Investigation. The mayor also saying that she does favor releasing the body camera footage and the dash camera footage at some point. It's just a question of when. But certainly, this new cell phone video raises a lot of questions. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.